Hey, it's John. Welcome back to my channel. And today I've got a much anticipated update on the California High Speed Rail project from the summer of 2021. Now, I know it won't come as a shock to many of you, but I am a huge supporter of this project. And that's why I'm glad that I was able to return to the San Joaquin Valley for a second year in a row and do another more comprehensive drone flyover of the project to see how much progress has been made. This video will be an overview of the project and the current state of construction. In future videos, you'll see a full flyover of the 119 mile long initial operating segment, so make sure you subscribe to see those. And before we go any further, I wanna give a huge shout out to my friend Cody. He came with me to California and drove me around the valley so I could get all the drone footage. Without him, these videos definitely would not have been possible, so thank you so much, man. All right, let's get into it. The new high-speed rail system is one part of the state's plan to modernize the entire rail system in California. The state has invested billions of dollars in removing grade crossings, expanding local and inner city passenger rail, and expanding freight rail capacity. The largest hole in the California rail system since the 1970s, however, has been a link between the San Joaquin Valley and the Los Angeles Basin over the San Gabriel Mountains. In the late 1990s, California had a plan in place to double track the Union Pacific's line over the Tehachapi Pass, thereby enabling passenger trains to run between Bakersfield and Los Angeles. For various reasons, that plan was scaled back in favor of building a new dedicated line that wouldn't be constrained by freight trains and would provide a much faster journey. Much like the original high-speed rail system, the Tokaido Shinkansen in central Japan, the California high-speed rail system is being built to add passenger capacity and reduce transit times from the existing transportation system. It's also being built to provide a tangible connection between Northern and Southern California while linking the historically underserved Central Valley. This also mirrors the societal split between the termini of the Tokaido Shinkansen. East and West Japan had historically been so isolated from each other that they even used different electrical plug types in their respective regions. While obviously all of the United States uses the same outlets, the realities of life and access to job opportunities in the Central Valley and the coastal cities couldn't be further apart. The Tokaido Shinkansen was also built as a symbol of national pride following the end of World War II and the American occupation of Japan. The Shinkansen began operating in 1964 ahead of the Tokyo Olympics and the entire world was able to witness a revolutionary transportation technology that to this day remains an unparalleled success. At the same time, America was in the process of drastically reshaping its own transportation system. The interstate highway program, I would argue, instead of being a transportation revolution, has succeeded despite itself. There's no question that the United States would be unable to function without the interstate system, but it hasn't come without an enormous cost, both in the form of massive government subsidies, which ultimately made private railroads unprofitable, and the destruction of almost every American city. In an attempt to improve transportation across the state and stimulate the economy of the more marginalized Central Valley, as well as fight climate change that was in no small part caused by automobiles and airplanes, the state decided to move ahead with the high-speed rail program. That's where Proposition 1A came in. In 2008, the residents of California approved the issuance of $9 billion in bonds to begin building the high-speed rail system. Fast forward 13 years and many failed lawsuits later, the initial operating segment is still under construction. While the specifics of the route and implementation of service have been tweaked many times, the fundamental goal of delivering a new high-speed rail system connecting Los Angeles and San Francisco, the second and 12th largest metropolitan areas in the country respectively, with electric trains traveling it up to 220 miles per hour or 355 kilometers per hour, has remained unchanged. Although only 119 miles or 191 kilometers are currently under construction, this fact has everything to do with ill-intentioned lawsuits and funding and nothing to do with a change in the overall project. I'm guessing that no rational people would consider either Los Angeles or San Francisco as nowhere. The 119 mile segment currently under construction extends from just north of Shafter to just north of Madera. The 2020 revised business plan has laid out a plan for introducing service between Merced and Bakersfield. To do this, an additional 33 miles or 53 kilometers of track will have to be built between Madera and Merced, and another 17 miles or 27 kilometers will have to be built between Shafter and Bakersfield. The 119 miles or 191 kilometers of line currently under construction is separated into three different segments known as construction packages. Each of these packages are being designed and built by a separate joint venture of engineering and construction companies. 
Starting in the north, the contract for construction package 1 was signed in August of 2013. CP1 is 32 miles or 51 kilometers in length and stretches from Avenue 19 in Madera Acres, California to East American Avenue just south of Fresno. While it isn't the largest construction package, the large number of civil structures in the Fresno area make it the most technically challenging package currently under construction. The joint venture building CP1 is made up of three large companies, Tudor Perini, Zachary, and Parsons. There are approximately 18 grade separations, five underpasses, six viaducts, one trench, and one tunnel that will be built as part of CP1. An approximately two mile long section of State Route 99 was also realigned and reconstructed to make room for the high speed rail tracks. There's also one station that would be built in Fresno and the option for one more station to be built just south of Madera if the need arises. The second section of line currently under construction is known as Construction Package 2-3. Two packages were combined to accelerate construction and the contract was signed with the joint venture of Dragados USA and Flatiron Construction in June of 2015. CP 2-3 extends from the southern end of CP 1 at East American Avenue and extends for 65 miles or 104 kilometers south to a spot one mile north of the Tulare Kern County line. While CP23 isn't as far along in construction as CP1, there are still several large structures being built in this section, and it is approximately twice as long as CP1. Depending on how you count them, there are approximately 32 grade separations, three underpasses, a significant amount of BNSF railway track realignment, and over a dozen viaduct structures. Two of these viaducts include large pergola structures. The third segment currently under construction is known as Construction Package 4. The contract for CP4 was signed February 29th, 2016, with the joint venture known as California Rail Builders. This joint venture is made up of Ferrovial Agriman West and the Griffith Company. At 22 miles or 35 kilometers in length, CP4 is arguably the furthest along of all three construction packages while also being the shortest. Starting one mile north of the Tulare Kern County line, CP4 runs to the intersection of Madera and Poplar Avenues, approximately one mile northwest of the town of Shafter. With only a handful of grade separations and one large viaduct structure, a much larger percentage of the high-speed rail right-of-way has been built up to its final grade compared to the other two construction packages. So when will this 119-mile section under construction be completed? The federal deadline for the three construction packages is 2022. Like all things in this world, the COVID-19 pandemic has significantly impacted this project, which is why the California High-Speed Rail Authority has asked Joe Biden for the 2022 deadline to be extended by a year. The authority made their final matching grant payment that was tied to the American Recovery and Reinvestment Act of 2009 in early 2021. There's approximately $4.2 billion in remaining funding available to the project, which comes from the original 2008 state bond issue. This bond money will cover the additional 52 miles or 83 kilometers of right-of-way that need to be built to complete the initial operating segment from Merced to Bakersfield. Additional federal funding, however, remains as uncertain as ever. Despite the project's high profile, there has been no direct mention of California high-speed rail in the pending federal infrastructure bill, which may or may not be passed soon. The bill is planning to allocate billions of dollars to the Northeast Corridor, which is great, but I don't think such an important project should be the victim of petty partisan bickering. Already, high-speed rail has created 5,200 construction jobs in California, and it will create thousands more permanent jobs when the entire project is built out. Given the uncertainty of the infrastructure bill or the reconciliation bill, or even the California budget surplus, I won't speculate on what funding the authority might receive. All three of these sources, however, are capable of funding the project. When the business plan was revised in 2020, a roadmap to opening the 171 mile or 275 kilometer initial operating segment was laid out based on already available funding. The five main objectives of the revised plan are to one, build out the remaining 51 miles or 84 kilometers of right-of-way on both ends of the segment currently being built, two, sign the contract for the construction of the track, signaling, and electrification systems. The authority released a request for proposals in December of 2019, and the bids are due in January 2022. Three, complete the route selection and environmental impact reports for the entire 500 mile or 800 kilometer phase one system. The authority has just recently certified the EIR for the Bakersfield to Palmdale segment. Four, complete major bookend projects to keep construction moving forward in the rest of the state. Examples of these projects include the electrification of the Caltrain corridor, which you can see a video on the progress of very shortly, right here on this channel, and the reconstruction of Los Angeles Union Station. 
Metro is currently completing the required federal environmental impact report for the Link US project. And five, when the 171 mile line is complete, the authority will open the initial operating segment between Merced and Bakersfield using the four new stations. Passengers will be able to transfer to ACE or Amtrak at Merced to continue their journeys west to the Bay Area or north to Sacramento. While this plan isn't perfect, there isn't a doubt in my mind that once people see the new high-speed line open and are able to ride new high-speed trains, there will be much stronger public support for finishing the line between San Francisco and Los Angeles, assuming that the project hasn't advanced before that point. For several years, the projected start of service has been in the year 2029. In the 2020 business plan, the authority did not provide a new projection of when service on the initial operating segment will begin, but it's safe to assume that without an increase in funding, that line likely won't be open to the public before that date. Now to get into the actual construction update. As I did with my update last year, I'll be going through this project from the south to the north. I've done this for a couple of reasons, but the main reason is that not staring into the sun makes for a much more enjoyable viewing. I've also created a Google spreadsheet, link in the description, with every large structure on it, comparing the state of construction from 2020 and 2021. This was truly necessary given the size of the project, so if you'd like to check that out, it's available to you. Now let's get into it. As you might imagine with such a huge project, some parts of the line are further along than others, so let's first take a look at the structures that are completely finished. Starting in CP4, the Pozo Creek Viaduct is a relatively short viaduct that carries high-speed rail over its titular creek. The viaduct is 240 feet long and 56 feet wide, or 73 meters by 17 meters. Next we have the Garkas Highway Viaduct. This viaduct is 102 feet long by 53 feet wide, or 31 meters by 16 meters. Notice how a rerouted Schofield Road on the right allows for only one viaduct to be built. While there are numerous structures in CP23 that are nearly complete, there's not a single project that is officially finished, so we'll skip to the start of CP1 at the American Avenue grade separation. This bridge was opened to traffic just after my construction update last year, and the bridge span is 353 feet or 107 meters long. Just north of American Avenue is the Musket Avenue Viaduct. This approximately 440 foot or 135 meter long viaduct is part of the larger viaduct structure that will carry high speed trains into southern Fresno. Jumping to downtown Fresno, we see the first completed high speed rail structure, which is the Tuolumne Street overpass. Originally, both the Tuolumne and Stanislaus Street overpasses were to be rebuilt in their existing one way traffic configuration. It was later decided, however, to rebuild Tuolumne as a two-way street and replace the Stanislaus Street overpass in the future if the need arose. The new bridge opened on August 4th, 2017. Jumping to North Fresno, we can see a 2-mile or 3.2-kilometer section of State Route 99 that was rebuilt and realigned. Caltrans oversaw this project, which was officially completed in February of 2019. As part of this project, the interchanges at Ashland and Clinton Avenues were rebuilt. This project was completed to provide a 100 foot or 30 meter wide right of way for high speed trains to travel between SR 99 and the Union Pacific tracks. Next we have a string of completed grade separations between Herndon and Madera. Here is the Avenue 7 grade separation, followed by the Avenues 8, 10, and 11. North of the nearly complete Avenue 12 grade separation, we have the Cottonwood Creek Viaduct. This 250 foot or 76 meter long viaduct was completed in 2018. Since then, new intrusion protection barrier walls have been built on both sides of Cottonwood Creek to protect the high speed rail tracks from potential derailments on the BNSF. Just north of here we have the completed Avenue 15 grade separation. This 278 foot or 85 meter long bridge was finished in 2020 and it carries Avenue 15 over both the high speed rail and BNSF tracks. Finally, we have one of the most iconic structures on the High Speed Rail project, and it was also the first project to begin construction. The Fresno River Viaduct is 1,600 feet or 488 meters long, and it's approximately 25 feet or 7.6 meters high. Work on the viaduct began in 2015, and it was completed in 2018. While not as ornate as some of the other structures in CP1, it's still a massive and hugely symbolic structure. The newest project to be officially completed is the Road 27 grade separation in Madera Acres. This bridge wasn't complete when I shot this footage, but it was officially opened on August 20th, 2021. I know the residents of Madera Acres are happy to have this project complete because traveling around it during construction was a pretty circuitous route. 
Now let's check out some of the projects that are almost complete. Back in CP4, the Pond Road Viaduct appears to be largely complete. This 121 foot or 37 meter long viaduct carries the high speed rail tracks over Pond Road and it is about 3.5 miles or 5.75 kilometers southeast of the Garkas Highway Viaduct. Just like Garkas, a bypass road has been built east of the high speed rail tracks to divert Magnolia Avenue. At the northern end of CP23, the South Avenue grade separation is basically complete. The 390 foot or 119 meter long bridge is finished and even striped, but it has not been open to traffic. South Avenue marks the northern end of the BNSF track realignment through the small town of Bowles. Finally, north of Fresno, the Avenue 12 grade separation is complete and open to traffic, but it hasn't officially been ticked off the list of active projects. The grade separation is much larger than most because of the distance between the high speed rail tracks and the BNSF tracks. Just north of Avenue 12 is the planned site of the Madera High Speed Rail Station. If this station is built, riders will be able to transfer between High Speed Rail and the Amtrak San Joaquins, just like the station in Merced. Now let's see some grade separations in CP23 where the bridges are complete, but the roadway isn't. At Avenue 88, we can see that the bridge spanning the High Speed Rail tracks, BNSF, and State Route 43 is complete, as are the two massive approach ramps on either side of the bridge. No paving work has been completed on the ramps, however. At both Kansas and Kent Avenues, the bridges were complete when I filmed them in 2020, but little progress is visible since then. I didn't film Kansas Avenue with the drone in 2020, but we can see a recently completed canal culvert east of the high-speed rail tracks. This culvert was completed in June of 2020, so I don't know why this grade separation isn't further along. A mile north at Kent Avenue, we see a similar situation. The bridge is complete, but here the western approach ramp is not complete. Unknown utility relocation work is ongoing to complete this gap in the roadway. Lastly, here at Excelsior Avenue, we can see the bridge that was completed in early 2020. I believe ongoing electrical line relocation is delaying the completion of this grade separation. Now let's check out the ongoing progress of the largest structures on this project. Up first is the Wasco Viaduct, just south of the town of Wasco. Here's what the viaduct looked like in 2020. Notice how the south abutment wall was still being framed, while the cast in place girder that ties the pergola columns together hadn't even reached the framing stage yet. About two thirds of the precast girders spanning the BNSF were installed. Now here's what the viaduct looks like in 2021. Rebar is installed for the deck on the southern viaduct and the overall structure is much further along. On the north end, a section of viaduct even appears to be complete. Not all of the precast girders are installed yet, and I know that there have been several delays caused by BNSF. In an effort to keep traffic moving relatively unimpeded, BNSF has canceled several Form Bs across their Bakersfield subdivision because there are multiple high-speed rail projects impacting this line. Fortunately, given how massive this structure is, it doesn't appear to have delayed progress on the viaduct too greatly. The Wasco viaduct will be 2,000 feet or 609 meters long. Next, we'll move on to a similar viaduct and pergola structure just south of Corcoran in CP23. In 2020, you can see that little more than clearing of trees was done at this site. North of Avenue 144, the high-speed rail embankment was being built up, but that's about all that was visible. This year, however, construction is in full swing. Spanning the Toole River, BNSF, SR43, and Avenue 144, the Toole River viaduct and pergola will be one of the most complex on the project. Piling is being installed to support the pergola columns, and some column rebar cages have already been installed. SR43 is temporarily being realigned to allow construction to move forward, and Avenue 144 has been closed to traffic west of the highway. The Tool River Viaduct will be 3,573 feet, or 1,089 meters long. North of the viaduct, a massive cast-in-place box culvert is being built to handle potential floodwaters. Also in CP23, the Hanford Viaduct is beginning to take shape east of the town of Hanford. In 2020, the majority of pilings had been installed for the 286 columns that needed to be erected. Several rebar cages had been installed and even a few columns had been completed. In 2021, however, the majority of columns are now complete and are awaiting construction of the cast-in-place deck structure. The King's to Larry Station will be built on top of this viaduct, which is why it's wider than the other structures we've seen so far. Two through tracks and two siding tracks will be built for trains to stop at this station. The Hanford Viaduct will be 6,330 feet or 1,929 meters long, so well in excess of a mile. 
North of the station, the viaduct returns to two tracks just before it crosses over Grangeville Boulevard. An interesting thing I noticed was that at the north end of the viaduct in 2020, there was a large pile of dirt built up. In 2021, however, that dirt pile has been removed and an abutment wall is being framed. I don't know if this means the design has changed, but I just thought it was interesting. The final massive structure under construction in CP23 is the Conejo Viaduct just south of the town of Conejo. Last year, only columns have been installed to support the pergola. Now, rebar is installed and concrete forms are being placed for the massive girder that will tie the columns together. I don't know if Dragados will try to coordinate the placement of precast girders with the nighttime BNSF outages for the Wasco Viaduct in CP4, but this is an example of the complex coordination that is necessary to bring this project to completion. Compared to the other massive structures on this project, the Conejo Viaduct is relatively short at 2,000 feet, or 609 meters, but it's still a massive structure. Moving on to CP1, the Cedar Viaduct is nearing completion. As the Cedar Viaduct was largely complete in 2020, the majority of the remaining work involves the decorative arched bridge spanning SR99. As you can see, precast concrete girders were placed over the southbound lanes of SR99, and the cast in place girder spanning the northbound lanes was still being formed. Here in 2021, you can see the Musket Avenue viaduct on the left, and as we pan to the north, we can see that the culvert carrying the North Central Canal has been completed this year, meaning that fill dirt can be placed linking the Musket Avenue Viaduct to the Cedar Viaduct. We can also see that cast-in-place girders spanning SR99 are complete, so work can move on to the arched structures. A final section of walls are awaiting framing just north of SR99, but the viaduct is substantially complete. At 3,700 feet or 1,127 meters long, the Cedar Viaduct is one of the highest profile structures on the entire project. Now onto one of the lowest profile structures on the project. Just north of downtown Fresno, the tracks will enter the Fresno Trench to pass under State Route 180, a canal, a Union Pacific Y, and Belmont Avenue. There hasn't been much progress on the trench since 2020, but the SR-180 passageway has been substantially complete since 2019. The final concrete walls have also been built over the secant piling retaining walls between the two legs of the UPY. The Belmont Avenue underpass will have to be removed and replaced with an overpass as the Fresno Trench will pass directly through the profile of the existing underpass. The 1 mile or 1.6 kilometer long trench will extend from Stanislaus Street to Olive Street, which will also be replaced with an overpass. Last on our tour of large structures, we reach possibly the most iconic structure on the whole project. The San Joaquin River Viaduct and Pergola marks the northern gateway into Fresno and it is essentially complete. Not much has changed since 2020 as the finishing touches were being put on the structure last year, but as we can see it appears to be complete. The temporary bridge that was built over the river during construction is still in place, although the northern span has been removed. At 4741 feet, or 1,445 meters long, it spans the Union Pacific tracks, as well as the San Joaquin River, and it is quite an impressive structure. So at this point, if you're already halfway into a page-long comment where every third word is boondoggle, then there's probably not much I can say to turn you into a supporter of high-speed rail. The fact is that high-speed rail is only effective at reducing CO2 emissions when trains have higher occupancy and are powered by low emissions energy sources. Driving between Los Angeles and San Francisco on Interstate 5 or SR99 makes you painfully aware of how much demand there is for travel between these two cities, not to mention the hundreds of flights that cross the state each day. The biggest advantage of trains is that when demand increases, instead of having to build more tracks, simply running more trains provides huge increases in capacity with minimal costs. More highway lanes and more runways will not solve this congestion. If those solutions worked, we would have examples to point to. Instead, because of the way induced demand works, adding more highway lanes only worsens traffic congestion. Expanding airports only increases the number of flights, which exponentially increases CO2 emissions. Whether you want to admit it or not, roads and airports are both very heavily subsidized by governments, which means government spending artificially lowers the cost of travel to consumers. This directly increases the consumption of fossil fuels. The only way to significantly lower transportation emissions is to ride trains. 8% of global motorized passenger transport and 7% of global freight are moved on trains, yet trains only use 2% of the world's transport energy. 
Electric cars do reduce emissions, but on the macro scale, they amount to little more than a band-aid solution. Electric cars have all the same problems as those powered by internal combustion engines, except they're heavier, which means that roads will ultimately require more maintenance in the future. Neither cars or airplanes are going away soon. Freeways continue to be built around the country, and airports continue to be expanded, all while the dystopian future of climate change that we were warned about for a half a century is unfolding right before our eyes. It's not just a coastal problem. When fire smoke from the west is carried halfway across the country and impacts people's ability to breathe here in Nebraska, that means it's also a Nebraska problem. We're all in this together, and it's time to get serious about fighting it. And before you even think about the H word, answer me this. How is a 500 mile long Hyperloop vacuum tube that's either built above or below ground going to be built if a conventional high speed railway can't be built in California? In case you didn't know, property rights extend below ground, which is why Pipeline and other utility companies have to purchase the land or an easement to build the underground utility on. Even if a Hyperloop could technically function, which it won't, what is the point of not building California high speed rail in its current form? Couldn't your techie, big brain venture capitalist figure out how to build it privately? You know, because it's going to be so wildly profitable? So again, I know that even if you're still watching, I'm probably not going to change your mind on this project. While America spent the last two decades and two trillion dollars proving that it has learned nothing about global politics since the end of World War II, the rest of the developed world has moved on. Since the Proposition 1A bond was passed in 2008, entire high-speed rail networks have been built around the world particularly in China. Instead of continuing to celebrate the massive but aging infrastructure improvements of the 1930s, which was almost nine decades ago, it's time to start building something new. It's time to actually invest in this country. It's time to create jobs, to unite communities, and to prepare for the future. It's time to finish California High Speed Rail. Thanks a lot for watching. If you liked this video, or if you hated it, I would really appreciate you letting me know. Make sure to subscribe so you can see my drone flyover of the entire project when it comes out. And if you're interested, you can check out my Patreon to see videos early and ad-free. As always, I will see you all soon.